Hi everyone who got Warhammer 40k Darktide for Christmas. How are you doing? Have you been enjoying the game so far? Be honest with me though. Be actual factual. Have you been harassed yet? Have you had someone scream obscenities and say things that someone would never say to a stranger in real life, but they do behind the cold, unfeeling barrier of a screen? I sure bet you have. No one will tell you this, but if you're still learning the game without looking up a guide beforehand, the community's more vocal members will tell you that you play this game with the precision and foresight of a person who builds a sandwich inside out with their eyes closed. I've been right there with you, my dear Christmas noobs, not truly knowing anything and just trying to enjoy something for the first time. And then like a panther in the night, some guy that's been silent the whole match goes down once and lets all that pent up aggression from his job out to tell you that you suck. Now let's be honest, you probably do, but everyone does when they start to learn something, especially if you're going in blind. So if you feel a little lost, let me help you out. So here's a list of 10 things that beginners should know before playing Dark Tide. At number one, we have the classic co-op horde shooter necessity. Please stick with your team. Even if one smells bad and another keeps looking at you weirdly and your homie flirts with you, oh, yeah. stick Just with your team. Mouth. Because it's much better to be uncomfortable than to be disposed of. You do not want to be found you don't want to be found alone. Because on top of all the other gameplay systems in Darktide, there's one that rewards team coherency above all else, which is called coherency. Coherency makes it so your toughness, which is like a regenerative shield, passively regenerates if you're close to your teammates. There are two ways that the game tells you about your coherency. One way is near the bottom of your screen that shows your passives and actives. The number beside tells you how many people, including you, are in your coherency. The other way the game notifies you is that it ridicules you and calls you an idiot when you're alone for a little too long, with your character often talking about being lost or alone while another teammate yells at you for wandering off while you look at pretty space marine statues or Lehman Russes. Or if you don't know anything about the Warhammer 40k lore, maybe you just wanted to be alone. In my solitude. Yeah, don't do that. Just stick with at least one teammate so you can help each other out. At number two, we have another cornerstone of co-op horde-based shooters that makes sticking with your homies not only encourage, but outright necessary. It's this cute little mechanic called pins. Pins make it so one person on the team can't move or defend themselves as their poor body is left to tend for itself and the elements. There are a few types of pins in this game. The most common type of pin is the one you see from these green pooches, Plaguehounds. They hit you with the triple dog death barrage, where they lunge at you, making you fall on the ground where they maul you. If you're pinned in this way, a small bit of damage being slung at the hound will knock it off of you and any of your teammates, making it the easiest to get rid of pin in the entire game. Trappers will throw a trap at you and run away to reload, attempting to get somebody else later on. The only way to get somebody up from a trapper net is to free them picking them up, which doesn't take long but leaves you vulnerable for like a second. Make sure the trapper is dealt with before you do it though, because standing still can be a death sentence. Or you'll be treated like the entirety of Bikini Bottom when SpongeBob and Patrick went alien hunting. Alien hunting! Look! Twins. Oh, there's also the Plague Beast, the Chaos Spawn, and Mutants, which cause displacements, which damage the grab character and then throw them out after some time. All of these can be broken out faster if damage is done to them or if the enemy is outright dealt with. So make sure to help your friends out because you wouldn't want to be stuck getting beaten up without somebody helping you, would you? And number three, I want to remind you that you should be wary of demon hosts. Demon hosts are formidable opponents that have a large health bar and big damage, but their crowning ability is that they can snap the neck of down player, instantly disposing of them. That's okay though, because you don't actually have to fight these emaciated, chained up freaks. As long as you do two things, don't get close to them and don't shoot them. You can always make one mistake with them, but don't make the second, because on the first stage, they get awakened and start glowing green. The second time, they'll start ripping through you. Try to find ways around them through alternate paths or by hugging walls if they're right in the middle of a place you need to go. But if you do need to fight them, the best way to deal with them is to have an ogre with a slab shield out to bunker down and take the aggro while everyone else unloads their guns into its back until it has a Looney Tunes-esque hole in the middle of it. Fourth and foremost, you should know the strengths and weaknesses of the characters you're playing. The ogre is the tank of the team, having the highest base stats for health and toughness. That does 
well at being stuck in a fight, being a slab of meat that has great crowd control and can take out specials if need be. The Zealot is good in melee and can be just as durable as the Ogren, but is more maneuverable, with more high risk, high reward gameplay. The Guardsman is good at doing range damage, with a focus on clicking on heads and locking in and taking out specials, while Psychers are wizards that deal with bosses and have a bit more supportive viability. But they suck really bad if they ever get into melee combat. Although all these can change through class variation and build, these are the main ways you usually play these classes. So this is all to say I don't want to see a Psyker rushing into combat head first or I'll turn him into a victim of Mount Vesuvius. Is that too soon? We got a scam alert at number 5! Because you should not try to spend your currencies early, they should mostly be spent when you get to level 30, because that's when you can start getting max power gear and the best blessings and other perks. A base weapon that you can get at max level has at least 300 power and has a max of 400 at the lowest rarity. While at level 1 through 5, you usually see stuff through 100 and 125 in your inventory. Keep your money up, kings, and spend it on a truly great weapon later than something right now. That being said, you don't have to hoard all of your shiny bits. If you want to try out a new weapon, you could always get one from the armory or a little nice suit from the commissionary. Just don't blow it all on Hadron's upgrades and drip. In number 6, I'm going to remind you to use the Psychonarium and the Meat Grinder. Even though you might have used it in the intro, I think most players probably forget about the Meat Grinder Psychonarium. The Meat Grinder reminds me most of a practice tool in a fighting game where you can test out weapons and equipment in a contained environment, allowing you to find out how hard enemies are to deal with in higher levels of difficulty. If you feel like you might want to go up a difficulty or test a build, this is always right here for you. It never hurts to do a little research in the lab. This is the number 7, and the number 7 would love to impart some knowledge on you. Its knowledge is that you should try to remember the sounds of every special enemy. Every special enemy when it spawned makes a special sound. Mutants have a scream with loud footsteps, hounds howl when they spawn and bark when they lunge, trappers laugh in their feminine voice, and have an electric charge up noise before they shoot their nets out. All of these pins and disables can be sidestepped with hounds being able to be shoved. Bursters make a ticking sound that gets faster and faster the closer they get to somebody until finally making a detonation noise. These bursters can be shoved away by anyone but are a bit risky, but you can kill them without using any ammo if you're good enough. Flamers also go and make a gas clicking stovetop burning sound, but monstrosities make a roar and change the music up. And although it isn't technically a sound, you can tell snipers are there by the glint in their scopes and by the red laser they put out to aim. Just knowing these can really help you understand when enemies are going to attack without being caught off guard, making every fight just a little bit more manageable. Number 8 has to do with Sire Milk? Milk? I have absolutely no idea. At level 11, Sire Malik's requisition opens up, and with that you get the ability to do weekly contracts. Weekly contracts allow you to get loot that's higher rarity and with a new special type of currency, with Milk acting as a contractor and vendor for that gear. These can really help you out later on for things like earning blessings on weapons or just getting good weapons that you can use on your own without having to look for a perfect one. For your own sanity, please only buy these at rank 30 for this guy too and don't do random acquisitions or you will lose all your currency for pretty much nothing. The amount of currency you can get in one week usually ranges make it so you can get one weapon. Try to get weapons that have at least tier 3 blessings or higher and have some blessings that you would like to see on the weapon of your choice. Just for that good stat increase and makes it so you know you would enjoy it. For number 9, we have a personal call out to a friend of mine who's new to the game. If you think this is you, hi, it probably is you. Just promise me. For the Emperor on his golden throne, please, please, please try to build accordingly. Example, if you're using a build that's about shooting lead as fast as you possibly can, maybe don't use a grenade launcher. Maybe use a machine gun or even a shotgun. Just try to make it so your loadout and build synergize with each other. It makes it so you're not only more effective, but probably having more fun in game play. And if you don't want to do that, I, I mean, I can't make you. I'm not your mom. But I think you would have a bit more fun if you play the game with synergy in mind. The last tip I have for you today is to communicate with your team if you want to have a certain challenge or penance done. The first few penances that came out the game are clean tasks that need the stars to align to be achieved and can be very hard to do as a player with random people in your lobby. Just communicate with them and communicate in general if you're going to get a penance done and what it requires if they need to do anything special and see if anyone is willing to help. If you can't do it in random lobbies, try looking in community discords and asking in an LFG if somebody can help you. Shout out to everyone that somehow completed the Ogren-1 free rework. 
I didn't do it personally before then, but I hope somehow some of you did. Well, those were my 10 tips for beginners in Dark Tide. Do you agree with them or do you think I'm just a bumbling idiot posting things online? Make sure to tell me in the comments down below. I hope this video can reach a fine poopaloo who might feel a little lost in Dark Tide. And I really hope you're enjoying Warhammer 40k Dark Tide if it is your first foray into the 40k universe. It's pretty great. Thank you if you got this far in the video and maybe leave a like and subscribe so you can help me out and see more videos like mine. Till next video fellas.